Welcome. My name's John Ferguson Smart, this is Jan Mollack, and today we are going to be talking about automated testing and a new way of doing automated testing that I think will change your view of how you approach automated testing in the future. It's an approach that we like to call screenplay. It doesn't come from us, it's been around for quite a while. It was originally imagined by a colleague of ours called uh, Anthony Marcano some years ago, and it has been evolving and developing in different names ever since. And this screenplay talk is going to explain a number of things about how it works, how you can apply it in your own projects, and how uh, it can benefit your software development process, not just from the point of view of test automation, but from the point of view of actually make, helping you to write better software. Also makes testing fun. I have a slight clicking issue. One of the big principles uh, behind this whole process, why we're doing this, is that what we find in a lot of teams that we go into is when they do test automation, it becomes a bit of a chore. Has anyone had that sort of experience? <laughs> no one. That's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so it becomes a bit of a chore. It becomes a fairly high maintenance problem. Uh, something that takes a lot of effort to maintain. The test can become fragile. The test can become difficult to maintain, difficult to extend, and it ends up taking more effort to actually keep track of the test, to maintain the test, than to uh, than the value you're getting out of them. And so. One of the concepts that we like to think of is in terms of making your tests sustainable, making the tests uh, blend into the development process so that you don't actually have that extra overhead where it's just a natural part of your development process. And that helps us shift away from the idea of tests that merely verify what's already been done, so writing regression tests after the code's been done, back to actually helping, making the tests help verify that you're actually building software that makes a difference. Cool. So there are three aspects of building sustainable automated tests that we would like to talk to you about today. And uh, they're actually related to the model that you see in front of you right now. So you're probably familiar with this one. Uh, has any one of you read uh, Eric Ries' uh, Lean Startup? Okay, cool. Quite a few guys. So Eric talks about this cycle of uh, learning, building, and measuring, uh, and the cycle that should be applied whenever you develop new features or develop new products or new, new companies. And what we found is that this, uh, this model could be applied to, your, to building your automated tests as well. So the way we'd like to look at it is that the requirements discovery process uh, is very similar to, to the learning experience. Well, once we understand what we need to build, well, we obviously need to uh, deliver a piece of functionality and there are certain practices of software craftsmanship that help us develop software that is uh, sustainable, easy to extend and scale and so on. And obviously we need to measure the impact of our automated tests, the impact of our software. And that's part of the, of the last cycle, the measure cycle. So the first aspect that we want to talk about is how to test blend into requirement discovery. So some of you may have heard of behavior-driven development. Anyone? One or two? I wrote a book on it. Uh, so <laughs> how do our tests blend in with behavior-driven development? I'll give you a little hint. Behavior-driven development has, is not actually about automated testing. But automated testing really helps with behavior-driven development if you do it properly. So when we look at the requirements side of things, what we found are some interesting numbers. Jan found these, actually. I have, yes. And it's actually quite difficult to uh, look up some actual studies in the field 
because uh, many people just, just quote a number without the source, right? So uh, I've actually gone into the trouble to figure out what the sources actually are. So it turns out that over the last 30 years or so, several studies have been done on uh, how unclear and ambiguous and incorrect requirements affect the way we develop software and uh, affect the number of defects we find in the software. So it turns out that uh, between 44 and 80 percent of all the bugs in software are caused by problems with requirements. So it seems like it makes sense to address this issue as part of our test automation effort, because now, otherwise, if we test a wrong requirement or we verify that application works according to a requirement that's incorrect, well, we're just building the wrong software, right? So it doesn't make sense. So what we find is that if we combine behavior development and a few other concepts like domain-driven design, people know about domain-driven design, domain-specific languages for your, uh, for your requirements, and user-centered design, we can take our tests to a totally new level. Yeah? So one of the techniques from user-centered design field is uh, called hierarchical task analysis. So instead of uh, designing our automated tests as a series of uh, interactions that a browser performs with a system under test, we could try to look at this uh, process from a slightly different perspective. So instead of focusing on the browser, we could focus on the actor, the user that uh, wants to achieve a certain goal by using our system. And in order to achieve this goal, he'll need to perform a number of tasks, which then consists of certain interactions with the system. So this change uh, of, of thinking makes us focus more on the user rather than the implementation detail, rather than the, the browser itself. And so what we see here is a little example of what this sort of layering or this sort of approach produces. So here we have a very simple example with a to-do list application, which I've used in some other tutorials and which you can find on in the, in the Serenity BDD documentation quite prominently, both for the Java and the JavaScript versions. It's uh, what we use for our smoke tests. And what we have here is effectively a hierarchy of very simple requirements. Now, in real applications, it can actually become more complicated than this, but you still get these layers. You still get this approach. The user has to achieve something. The user goes in to use the system to have some sort of outcome. And if you don't understand where that outcome is coming from, and if you don't document to explain what you're doing, then your tests become a lot less useful. So we start off with trying to figure out what the goals are, what the user is actually trying to achieve for their business, for their business goals, what, they, what they're going to get out of the system. Then to achieve a goal, the user has to do some stuff, perform tasks. Now, if we're talking about software, then typically those tasks will involve interacting, so interactions with the system. The interactions may involve things like typing values into fields, clicking buttons, and so forth. The problem we find is most tests start off at the interaction level. Most automated Selenium tests, and even you see tutorials on Cucumber, and they make me wince because they're pure interactions. They're just sequences of clicks, click, select, click, select, enter, enter, click, about 100 of them. Has anyone seen things like that? given I click on the button and I enter this field, and what, the f what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, We don't want that. That's really bad. That's not how you write tests. And one of the reasons why this is bad is because if you show this sort of test script uh, to a business person, to, to a product owner, and ask them to verify the, the flow, the, the logic behind it, the business logic behind it, they'll most of the time just say, uh, yeah, I just trust you. Yeah, it works fine. I'm sure it's good. And ignore the whole thing. And because they start to ignore the, the test automation, at some point they might come to a conclusion that you know, if those tests that you know, became brittle over time, become slow as well, well, then perhaps we should just you know, turn them off. You know, deploy software to production, test it there. Everybody tests stuff in production, right? Does everybody here test software in production? Isn't okay. that how you do it? Yeah, that yeah. works. 
Use as a four. No, but two sides got me, huh? Cool. Oops. Yeah. Back a bit. Back yeah, a bit. I told you this was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go back, go back. You control. So here we have a example of a cucumber. Simple. Is everybody okay with cucumber, gherkin, so forth? Could be J behave, doesn't matter. Could be anything, as long as it's sort of gherkin-ish. We have a feature. And our feature is you told me this was going to happen, didn't you? It is, yeah, like a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, so we have our feature. Our feature is a very simple one where James uh, is our persona. Uh, James wants to be able to focus on the things he has to do, the outstanding items. So he wants to be able to filter his to-do list and only see the things that haven't been done. Yeah. And there's quite a few interesting subtleties here. So first of all, as you see here, if this laser works, yeah, it does. We use the persona of James, right? So very often when uh, we see feature files written in Cucumber, those would refer to I rather than the persona. And there's a trouble with that. Uh, there is a trouble that relates to empathy. Whenever we describe a fe uh, f uh, feature from the point of view of ourselves, we also automatically think about all the limitations that we, we ourselves have. So we think about the person sitting in a nice and cozy office, you know, who is warm, who, is, uh, who has you know, ready access to coffee, water, whatever else, who has a nice big screen, a nice comfortable chair, and so on. Now, if we try to combine the, the uh, findings of our user experience process, so to try to combine the ideas of personas, and actually think about those personas when we design automated tests, we empathize more with the user. So if we think of James as a guy who's using our application on a uh, busy tube, he's using this on a mobile, maybe perhaps he doesn't have no internet connection all the time and so on, we might actually come up with scenarios that are much more comprehensive than what we would have come up with if we were just thinking from the point of view of ourselves. So if we have a look at this scenario, we've got our actor, James, who has a particular goal in order to focus on the outstanding out item. So you can see this structure that we can actually get to visualize in our feature files if we do them properly. We have our goal in order to focus on outstanding items and we have some tasks. So James has got a list uh, with some items in it. He completes one item, he filters the item. So these are all tasks, yeah? And then we've got a sort of task. It's not really a task, it's actually a question because you're asking a question about the state of the system, but same diff, same level. We've got these ta the goal, to achieve those goals, the actor has to do a certain number of things. And very often that's where the, the domain modeling of our test uh, scripts or test scenarios uh, ends. So at this level, we still have those high-level business goals, business tasks, expressed in domain language. They're nice, they're not implementation specific, and everything's perfect here. But what we find is that very often trouble starts at the step definition level, where this whole domain knowledge evaporates suddenly, and we start talking about web driver clicking, web driver entering values, and so on. So what we'd like to show is how we can avoid this sort of problem. So, when we have a task, any of those tasks are actually, all of the tasks actually can map to more low-level actions. So we might have actions which we might describe as complete a to-do item or filter a list or expect to see, get a coffee. So these are a notch lower down. But these can be viewed as building blocks, as reusable action or tasks that you can use to implement this test, but also other tests. And this is at sort of the heart of the idea of, this, of the screenplay pattern. Rather than expressing your tests in terms of interactions with the UI, you express your tests in terms of what the business user, what the actor is trying to achieve. Express your tests in terms of business tasks, not in terms of interactions. This is quite interesting as well because this, this simple switch allows us to think about those tasks as well, composites of other lower level ones. So for example, to start with an application or start with a to-do list containing, it means to open the browser, resize the browser window, add an item, and so on. And we could take this further. 
So we could define a task to add an item to a to-do list as entering the value into a field, hitting the enter key, and so on. And the interesting thing here is that there's only a finite number of tasks that the user can perform in our application. But there's a much larger number of scenarios than there's a number of tasks. So this sort of model leads to a very high code reuse across the code base. In fact, we've seen applications where you get almost an 80% code reuse of these components between tests, which makes us obviously the scalability of these tests fairly uh, significant. It means that there's a lot less code to write and a lot less code for people to understand when they come on board and try and uh, start being productive with an existing test suite. What we see a lot in uh, on client sites is you'll have teams not of one or two testers but of 10 or 15 or 20 testers uh, and you'll get a certain amount of churn, obviously, so people have to be able to come on board and understand how the tests work and how to become productive quite quickly. And that's very difficult if you have tests that are basically just a sequence of clicks or even tests that are at much higher level but just interacting with pages. It's very hard to get people on board and up to speed quickly, whereas with this approach, we find that people can relate much more easily to, oh yeah, these, if I understand the business domain, I understand what the application does in business terms, I can take these tasks and reuse them and compose them and modify them. When, I'm get, when I get comfortable with that, I can look into the details and see what they do at a lower level, at the interaction level. So it's a much smoother ramp up for people coming onto the project. We find that really, really impressive. So now the question is, how do we actually implement it, right? Because now it's very nice to have a model, but a model without the implementation is just, just an idea, right? You, you can't really use it. Which leads on to the text part. 40 to 70 percent. This is, and I've actually seen higher than this, sometimes it goes to 100 percent, but it's 100 percent, it's the point at which the test suite gets thrown away and rebuilt from scratch. Uh, we we're talking to one client where they have, for the last 12 months, they've actually, every three months, been writing tests, automated tests, and every three months they'll ditch it and start again because the tests just become so, so hard to maintain. And what we find is in a lot of projects or environments, testing is kind of a second-class citizen. It's not real. It's just scripting. Anyone can do it, Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you end up with very, you don't have the same attention applied to automated testing as you do in production code. Or if you apply the same level of care as we see in automated testing to your production code, I'd be really worried about the production code. But what we really need to do is automated testing is an engineering skill. It needs to be done with care, with attention. You need to take pride in the code that you're writing. And the only way to get these figures down and actually keep a nice high maintenance or low maintenance cost and high productivity and high output and enjoyable work is to take pride in the code and apply the same principles of software craftsmanship, your clean coding, your refactoring, your readable code, your DSLs, all of this good stuff, you want to apply it to your test automation as well as to your, uh, your production code. And this may sound quite obvious, but we see it very, very rarely applied in practice, not to this level anyway. So now we're going to have a look at how we would actually implement this, or how we implement it. So this is, we're using Serenity BDD, which is, uh, this is the Java version. There's also a Java, JavaScript version, uh, which has very similar code. It looks very similar, it's a very similar behavior, produces the same reports and so forth. Uh, and the gen, but the general approach is actually something you could apply in any language. It's just that Serenity BDD provides you a lot of things out of the box that you don't have to do for yourself. Yeah, and the reason why we use a, a testing library like Serenity BDD is because now, if you think about it, applying the same uh, principles of software craftsmanship to your test code as to your production code is an investment, right? It takes time. And it's sometimes difficult to justify spending a lot of time on automated tests. 
it's difficult to explain to the business that oh, this is something that's, that's worth doing. So building something from scratch yourself takes time, is expensive, so it might be actually better to use something that's already available, that's been tested, you know, that's, that's open source and free. So if you think about it, many of us developers, whenever we start uh, writing our first blog, we would start with actually writing the blog, the blog engine, rather than the article. So similarly here, we can use an, an open source framework to just focus on the business logic and implementing what, what actually matters. So a few things that Serenity does, or the process, it's really Serenity encourages you to work well. It's not just a tool, it's a process that the tool encourages. And it helps you move towards, uh, we, uh, someone referred to it as a gateway drug for BDD. <laughs> Uh, you can tweet that. <laughs> so it's basically the way you work in Serenity BDD gives you a very BDD feel to your application, even if you're writing tests. Like we're seeing teams that are forced to write tests after because they start their automation halfway through the project, so they've got a whole lot of backlog that they need to automate. But they do it using a very BDD style. And it becomes very natural when you start actually doing proper BDD and collaboration and automating proper acceptance criteria, it's a very smooth transition. And this makes it much easier to write tests that actually focus on what's important, focus on things that, are, that the tests are meant to validate. So you can highlight, does a feature actually do what it's supposed to do? It's much easier to focus at that level if you're thinking at that level. I don't know whether you've ever noticed, but it's very hard to focus at several levels at the same time. If you're focusing on what the clicks and the, U, the clicks do, what the input fields do and so forth, it's hard to simultaneously focus on the flow and the outputs. So if all of your tests reason in terms of how you interact with a UI, chances are it's harder to concentrate on whether you're actually achieving the goal or if there are other better ways of achieving those goals. So the way we structure our tests in Serenity helps you focus on these high level goals and switch between levels as you need to and focus on the right level at the right point in your development. Yeah, I think we should skip to the action, huh? You think so? Yeah, I think so, yeah. They're dead, they like it. So you probably remember this, this little graph that we showed you earlier. So actors want to achieve certain goals, and that's why they perform tasks that consist of interactions. So how would this work in, the, in terms of actual implementation? So that's pretty much the amount of code you need to set up an actor. Well, you get to call the actor uh, named and then give it, give it the name of the persona. And if you co uh, combine it with the personas that you use in your user experience uh, design process, then you get a nice mapping of the, the persona characteristic to the actual functionalities that the persona uses. Now, actors can have abilities that enable them to interact with the system. In this particular case, we've got the actor who has the ability to browse the web with his browser, but he could also interact with our system using a HTTP client or an FTP client or whatever else we, we, we need in order to, uh, to interact with, uh, with the application. And he can have multiple abilities, and those abilities enable interactions. That's pretty much how you structure the flow of tasks. So you call James attempts to, and then pass a number of, of task objects, such as add a to-do item, or pay with, pay with a default credit card, or add a product to the basket. So as you can see from the point of view of code, it's very, very simple. And what we found is that you can uh, get people who've never written any code to compose those sorts of uh, test automation scenarios very easily, even if they don't understand Java very well. So you, you can get a nice mixture of, of people on a, on a test automation team, if you have one, some of them with more development experience who can design those low-level interactions or more complex interactions with the system that actually have to call certain external APIs and so on. And you can get the less experienced guys to uh, compose the test scenarios from those building blocks. 
And in the process of, uh, of designing those test scenarios, they'll actually get to know the application better, they'll get more familiar with, with Java, with, with programming practices, and at some point they might also start developing their own, their own tasks. Now this is a, this is a Cucumber, have people, who's used Cucumber JVM? So you'll be kind of familiar with this approach. The previous example was actually JUnit. So you can use Serenity in either JUnit or Cucumber or JBehave, whatever you prefer. And the code under the hood is very similar. So here we have an actual step definition where we're showing how you would map something like uh, James has a to-do list containing whatever. And here we map that can list to some items and we just say James attempts to start with a to-do list containing items. So at the heart of the screenplay pattern is this idea of building reusable blocks, a bit like a DSL. You're writing your own domain language around the business domain in terms of what the business would actually understand. And that's really important. That's what gives you the power to scale your tests in terms of reusable building blocks that aren't at the UI level or aren't at the interaction level. Now, this also leads to much higher reusability, because if you think about it, large software systems will typically have a number of components. So let's say an e-commerce uh, system will have a checkout component, a, a search component, and so on. And often you'll have different teams developing those. So what we found is that it's quite effective for those teams to ship the, the tasks that are uh, required for their component to be tested. So then if at some point you need to do a full integration test of the entire system, what you can do, you can just you know, use those tasks from different teams that are basically just Java classes. So you can jar them up and share them very easily as you would any other Java code. And you could assemble those into a much more sophisticated end-to-end sophisticated -end tests of the entire system without the risk of duplicating the effort across those two. Parts. So in this case, what are we showing here? We've got a, the actual implementation of the, uh, of the task. So you remember we had those lay that layered approach where we had business tasks going down and inside business tasks we have interactions with the UI. And you can see actually this is, looks very similar to the previous class because all we're doing is using this same approach. We've got an actor who attempts to do stuff actor attempts to do a list of things and those things are either tasks or interactions and in this case we've got the things are we're opening a browser and then we're calling a business task that we've already referred to so add some to-do items so you can see here the reusability so some all of the UI components come out of the box you don't have to actually write them for yourself but you are writing these business ones so in this case add a to-do item and there's one more in interesting thing here. So as you'll notice here at the top, we've got a little step annotation. So maybe let's start with a quick question. How many of you enjoy writing documentation? OK, <laughs> maybe I'll repeat the question. So how many of you do enjoy writing documentation? One, two, OK, about five. Right. Hmm. Do I need to repeat it again? No, I think that was pretty much the answer. So the trouble is that no, uh, documentation is, if, if testing is an afterthought, then documentation is very often an afterthought after testing. So it's very often omitted. And whenever we actually see documentation of a software system, it's usually not up to date or it's just not relevant and we could you know, toss it into, bin, into a bin. So what this little annotation here uh, is doing is it allows you to map the specific task class to a more human-readable description of it. And this is used when uh, you execute the tests and generate living documentation from those. So what we can do is when we execute those tests, we map every single task to a human-readable description. We can accompany it optionally with a screenshot, and that's how we can get documentation pretty much for free as part of our uh, test automation process. And here we can see what it actually looks like under the hood you go down into a, how does the add a to-do list task work? Well, it works by we enter a value into a field and then we hit return. So if you show that to a tester, they'll be able to pick that up quite quickly because it's pretty much auto-complete and away you go. There are a number of uh, UI interaction tasks that you can use that are pretty much mapped to everything you normally do with WebDriver. And it makes it very easy for testers to actually relate to this and use it without a great deal of training in, uh, in WebDriver in the subtleties of uh, the WebDriver API. 
And this brings us to the third element, which is the feedback cycle. So you, if your tests are run, but all they do is give you red or green, well, that's useful feedback, but it's not really going to tell you whether you can go into production, whether you can release your software. One of the big things about Serenity is we try and... Serenity is a living documentation tool. It's what we call release, gives release readiness reporting. It lets you know whether you're actually ready to release a software, uh, software component, whether features are ready to go, whether a release will actually work in production, whether everything that we promised has actually been built. And this idea, you don't just don't get it in test reports. It's very hard to see, have this visibility in classic test reports. So it will become more apparent when we show you some of the examples of this documentation. But the reason why we think it's very important to have this sort of uh, documentation in place is because it helps to build trust with different uh, parties uh, involved in software development. So trust with the business, trust with, with the software developers, trust with testers and so on. And that's trust that's, that's very strong because it's built on evidence. Because we can actually prove that our software works the way it's tended to work, that it covers the features uh, that it's supposed to cover. And it's not just about you know, us telling someone else that, oh, yeah, I tested this software on my machine, it works fine. We can actually prove it. And one of the big concepts of this trust is thinking in terms of, as I was saying, there are levels of focus. If you're focusing on something at a very high level, it's hard to think at a low level and vice versa. In reporting and, and feedback, it's the same thing. We have what I call levels of communication. So we have, for instance, at a very high level, you want to know whether the features you planned or promised to deliver in a particular release are actually working, whether the ones that are there are good to go, whether, whether they've been complete, completely finished, whether they're broken. Uh, in a traditional test report, you can know what's tested. In a release readiness report, you want to know what also what features have not been tested. It's very hard to get a test report to tell you what's not tested. So that's what we try and do here as well. When we go down a level, we can have a look at the actual features. How is a feature documented? How does it work? Does it do what the business expected it to do. And then if we take it a notch down, we can actually see the details of examples. How do, what steps are involved in a particular example, in a particular scenario? How does a particular goal play out? How does a task uh, user accomplish a particular task? And this maps directly to our idea of our capabilities, our features and our scenarios. Because at the higher level, we're reasoning in terms of goals and capabilities. And as we go down, we think more in terms of features, then detailed scenarios or examples of how those features are actually delivered. For instance, in this case, uh, you probably can't read all the details, but the, uh, the, uh, this is what we call a release readiness report. It's the highest level. You can see we have a list of capabilities Rather, it's not just a list of test results, it's a list of what capabilities did you say you were going to deliver. We can see we've got some here that are red, some here that are orange. One's completely green, one's got a little bit of blue in it. The blue means pending, things that haven't been completed. Uh, red obviously means it's broken, but uh, blue is interesting because blue means that you've engaged, you've said you're going to deliver something, but it hasn't actually been tested yet. And if it's not tested, in Agile terms, in BDD terms, if it's not tested, it's not done. Your test is your feedback, your documentation that the feature has actually been delivered. And so when we have a report like this, one where we have some blue and some uh, grey, which means totally not implemented, mm -hmm. uh, we get the impression of, OK, these features are done, but this one's not really finished. We haven't done everything we said we'd do. Is that good or not? It also helps with uh, with our BDD process as well. So, for those of you who use uh, BDD, how many of you do the Three Amigos meeting? Where you define the examples and scenarios and so on. Okay, so some of us, cool. And how many of you try to write the given when then Gherkin scenarios during those meetings? Okay. And how do you find it that it's easy to engage with the business by writing those scenarios? How easy it is to get those guys to do them with you and to find their time? Yep. 
Oh, one person. Cool. Good job. <laughs> So what we found is that uh, by uh, simply capturing some of the examples of how a feature uh, is supposed to work and uh, marking those as pending even before we write the actual implementation and even before we write the Gherkin scenarios, the given when dense, uh, we can capture those and report on those. So we can at least record that there have been some examples provided and we'll, guys sh we'll show you a code demo of how this whole thing works in a couple of minutes. So as we go down the stack, we go from release readiness down into capabilities. We go further down into features. And as we go down, we get more detailed. And eventually, we get to the scenarios where we're effectively documenting how a feature works through a set of worked examples illustrated by screenshots if it's a UI test. But we're illustrating the steps that the business or the user would actually do. And you'll see we're not talking about clicks here, not initially. We're or well, we are with the James clicks on a complete button, but that's underneath. At the top level, we're still just reasoning in terms of business tasks, just like we saw earlier on when we were reasoning in terms of what do you need to achieve at a certain level. I think it's like for a code demo. You think so? Yeah, because we've been just talking about slides, and those guys would like to see something working, I guess. Anyone want to see something working? Or do you prefer the slides? Because we've got some more slides if you want. No? Code? Code. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so what I have here is an application. This is a live one, so it probably won't work. Uh, but this is a real live application where you can do things like book a train from London to Brighton, or for example, and Come up, and you will come up with some results. Hopefully, if the network is network gods are favourable, mm -hmm. and you have to set the date, otherwise it has funny results. It's a bit of a dodgy application, this one. This is the application. I wanted to choose this application because it's a little bit closer to real world. It is a real world application, so you get some of the real world challenges uh, rather than our smoke test application. And so, what we have here in our application, this is a. Uh, can we see the hierarchy? Probably not really very well. Let's start off with something that will be a little bit familiar. We have a feature file about buying individual tickets. We have another feature file maybe about buying season tickets. Then we have some other requirements. We know we need to download, be able to access offline timetables and view the timetables, and so forth. Now, you notice these ones are pending. And the reason they're pending is that nobody's actually got around to doing them yet. So if we wanted to report on them, we'd want to note that they're in the list of things to do, but we don't want to actually uh, have them break because that would be inaccurate. They're not done yet. So we have them appearing as pending in our reports. Uh, if we go back to our by individual test, which is a little bit more interesting, Here, you'll notice, we've got, we were talking about persona earlier on. And here we've got, so Tracy, who wants to go from London to York for a festival. We've also got Bill, who wants to go to Birmingham for a work trip. And we've got some little details about why they want to do this, to give them motivation. This is very important from the user, uh, the user experience point of view. It uh, makes, encourages people to have a little bit more empathy about their end users and understand where they're coming from. Uh, but I'm guessing you'd like to see some code too, yeah? You think? Yeah, let's go there. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is Cucumber, yeah? Here we have the actual implementation of Tracy has decided to check the available tickets. Now, you know, earlier on we had James, who was an actor. In Cucumber, what we do is we say the actor called and it will figure out what, it will create an actor for you. So you can have multiple actors, you can even have several different actors in the same scenario. And if you're doing a web test, what's quite cool is you can have multiple, so different, several actors and they'll all have their own browsers. So you have, if you have a workflow system, you can have one actor who uh, submits an item to be processed or to be, uh, to be dealt with, another actor who will pick it up in their own browser, it can go back and forth and so forth. So that's, 
quite a natural way of modeling the user interactions, the user experiences. Another thing is that you could also give those actors different abilities. So for example, one actor could be using the web browser, another one could be using a mobile browser. Uh, and then, let's have a look at the next step. So, you notice here we had the actor called persona. Now, here we've got he or she. So when she looks at a, tip, a trip from origin to destination, leaving on a particular day, uh, rather than saying the name of the actor, we just say the actor in the spotlight. So the previous actor that you said, that you invoked, that you called on the stage, to use a metaphor, uh, becomes the actor in the spotlight. And now, this is the interesting bit. No clicks, no selects, no drop-downs. What we're doing is a business task. We're finding tickets for a one-way trip from a certain origin to a certain destination, leaving on a particular day. So again, no user interaction. We've got a totally reusable component. And if we look at this second trip, when he looks for a return trip, so we've got Bill who's going on a, wants to do a return trip. Let's look at the code. It's very similar. We've got find tickets for a return trip. So from a user, if you've got a tester looking at this, this is very, very accessible because it's expressing things in business terms, not in any sort of UI or technical terms. And that's really important. It's all about reusability and composability. And then the third level, she should be shown the cheapest tick signal ticket price from London to York. We've summarised quite a lot of checks here, in fact. We're summarising the outcome that we expect. Now, how do we implement that? Now, in Serenity, we have this idea called uh, questions. So we say the actor in the spotlight should, and we can give a list of questions or based statements describing our expectations. So we should see that the low available journey's lowest price is present, that the ticket type is equal to what we expect, that the origin and destination are equal to what we expect. Now, I don't know whether anyone saw the JUnit 5 talk where if one, where you had uh, asserts, a list of asserts where if one assert failed, the other ones would still get evaluated. Anyone see that? Yeah? This is the same thing, except you don't need JUnit 5. <laughs> and it works. Uh, now, I mean. So this is basically, if any of those checks fails, the others will still get evaluated. It's not like a traditional test where, if WebDriver test where if something breaks, Basically, that's the end of the game. Nothing else happens. You're, uh, you're left to your own devices to figure out what went wrong, and you don't know anything else. So here, if we've got the ticket type is wrong, we'll still get to know whether the, other, whether the stations are correctly defined. And as you can see, there was absolutely no magic there. So all those statements, like you know, equal to ignore case or uh, equal to, are just Hamcrest matchers. So if you need any custom ones, you just create a, a custom Hamcrest matcher. So that's pretty much the, the standard way of, of doing assertions in, in frameworks like, like JUnit, for instance. Now let's have a look at how we actually interact, how these tasks get broken down. So this is a different example, to obviously, to the one you saw in the slides. We have, for instance, a one-way trip. Now in Serenity, you tend to use screenplay, you use a lot of builders to create basically a DSL. So what we have here is a little DSL that simply gives you a different builder for each type of trip. So you write your own, so they're not a big deal. Uh, so if we have a one-way trip, we're going to create this little builder that where we define the destination, the departure station, uh, and the day we want to leave. And eventually we do this little magic thing, find one-way tickets. And that's our actual task that we build. There's a little bit of magic going on here with the instrumented method that lets Serenity do its reporting. Uh, if we go into that task, this is a little bit like the code that we saw in the slides, where we have the actor who attempts to do stuff. So we've got the actor, the actor selecting stations, entering a day, and clicking on a button. Yeah? So yeah. it's all very composable. Now, if... Uh, 
this selecting the station is actually a little bit complicated because if we look at the, the actual, that'll make the demos interesting. <laughs> well, I'll describe it. If you go into the drop down, basically the select a station, it looks like a drop down, but it's not. You type the, type the station, it creates a list of suggestions. You click on the suggestion, it fills it. Uh, in the JavaScript behind the scenes. So it's actually relatively non-trivial. But what we've done here is hidden it away in a reusable task or interaction task. So if we wanted to look in the details, we've got enter the value station name into a particular dropdown and then click on the dropdown entry with that name. So we're hiding that detail in a reusable UI interaction. So you do a lot of this reusable task in Serenity, it's very, very composable, makes it really easy to create these tasks and reuse them, uh, which is uh, really, really nice. Uh, I guess we should say, show how we identify elements, shouldn't we? That as well, yeah. Do we have the internet already? Or no, we don't. Dead? Okay, cool. Who needs internet? All right. So uh, maybe before we go there, how many of you guys use page objects in your test automation? Okay. And a uh, quick question, what is a good length of a page object? How many lines of code should it have? Is it okay for it to have, I don't know, 10? Or do you usually get longer than that? 50? Is 50 still fine? 100? We've seen some that actually reach 1,000 lines or more. So we'll show you a slightly more compact version of those page objects as well. So the idea of... Uh, the problem we find with large page objects is they become hard to maintain and the idea of a page object is dates to 2009. Uh, nowadays, the concept of a page is a little bit different. I mean, what's a page in a single page app? You either get a great big massive page object that does everything or you have to break it up into little bits and pieces and that's fairly arbitrary. Do you do a hierarchy? Do you have com composition? It gets complicated. So what we do in screenplays, we keep the page objects to a strict minimum and they're kind of page objects but not really. They're just basically classes that know where to identify things or to find things on a page that we're interested in for a particular task. For instance, here we have the journey details. Actually, let's go back to the uh, station, select the station. This is our reusable tasks, if we remember. And we have our the station dropdown and the dropdown entry. If we look at this relatively big one, because it actually represents the whole block of selecting a station, picking whether it's return or signal and so forth. That's a relatively large page object in screenplay terms. And you'll notice what it's really doing is basically identifying where to find stuff. Now, you'll see it's got this funny target class. We use the target class. We could use buys or Selenium, classic Selenium finders, but we use the target class because it lets us identify what we're finding in a readable way that we place in the report. So you don't have to uh, talk about a CSS classes or XPath or nasty things like that. You can actually describe what you're trying to identify and that that's what you'll see in the reports. And you notice here we've got some funky ones where you can actually have variable substitution. So you would say the drop-down entry, and we've got a little variable here. So the drop-down entry for a particular station name. So you can do dynamic targets as well. And so we've got sort of around 10 minutes left. So rather than running the application without internet, which is probably relatively risky, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, show you what the reports for the last run we ran look like. So this is a real live report. Uh, now you remember all those tasks we had, those requirements we had that we hadn't actually got round to doing? That's the big blue bit. If we look in turn, but from here you can see there's something broken, something running, some things that aren't done. That's a list of test results. If you think in terms of requirements, it's quite different. We've got the buy tickets, which is a third working, a third broken, and a third not done at all, and consult the timetables. 
nothing at all. Very, it's very concise and very, it's a very nice way of seeing, getting an overview of what you're, actually look, what you're actually going to deliver if you deliver at this point in time. So okay. let's look at the... Maybe a quick one thing. Uh, so by saying that uh, we're capturing the pending and not done requirements here, we're by no means suggesting that you should capture all your requirements before you start your project. Nothing like that. We're just saying that you know, if you learn about a new requirement or a new scenario, it's better to capture it uh, in code and under version control than on some sticky note somewhere. And uh, so let's just step into the requirements or into one of the test reports. So here's one where we have trace. So you remember all those bits of information that we had in the feature files that give some context. We try and reflect that in the report. So you see all that information, you get the context for what the requirement is, at, what the scenario is trying to show, not just some checks. And so here we've got, given that Tracy wants to buy some tickets, she wants to go from London to York tomorrow, and she should see the ticket price for London to York. And how does that work? Well, inside we've got quite a complicated sequence of in of tasks and interactions, but from a top level, it's just summarised in this one lev one step. But here, if we wanted to see the details, we can look at the screenshots and step through them. We could go in here and uh, have a sort of comic strip version where we step through the task. I don't know whether you can see up the top here. We've got the uh, task that's actually being displayed, and we can see what's going, what's actually going on, which is uh, quite nice. And uh, if we want to see how, whether it actually worked, you remember those asserts we showed at the end? We see the list here. And oh, one other thing which is really nice, remember the target had those little texts rather than CSS? Here you notice we're saying we're clicking on the drop-down entry London or where, uh, well that one wasn't configured properly, we're clicking on the buy tickets button. We're describing the interactions in a readable form, not in terms of CSS. If something goes wrong, on the other hand, it will tell you. So there's one of these which uh, went drastically wrong. And we can see it says immediately, oh, no such element it timed out when it was looking for the place header price to be displayed. So it wasn't fired. Obviously, for some reason, it didn't get to the final page. So when you get an error, it makes it a bit easier to troubleshoot. It does tell you what you need to know, but if you're not interested in the CSS selectors, you just want to know how does it behave, that's cool. It'll just tell you what you're trying to do in terms of business flow. And this helps to address the needs of different audiences as well, because the, the, the business guys are hardly ever interested in the XPath that you use to write an automated test. They're more interested in the actual logic that's been implemented, especially for, um, for systems where audit uh, is, is um, important. Like, like tra trading systems, for instance, or banking systems. However, on the other hand, when things go wrong, well, it's usually a developer or a tester reviewing the test report uh, who need to understand what exactly happened. And that's when we show the stack traces, that's when we show the XPath and so on, because that's actually useful in this context. So that's pretty much all we have time for, except for we'll leave a little bit of time for questions. This code is available on... Uh, if I have my slides back... This code is available on this URL or will be available as soon as we upload the final version. So if you want to take a photo, a copy of that, a photo of that, you'll be able to play around with this at home. Uh, but uh, with that, I think we can open the floor to questions. We've got about five minutes for questions. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, try and go to a microphone so I can get recorded. Any questions? Oh, the stickers as well. Mm -hmm. You better mention the stickers before we forget. We have stickers. <laughs> okay, cool. thank you.